Hello, good day everyone and welcome back. So this is the second part of our uh, seminar, uh, not exactly, more like a lecture video about piracy and armed robbery. So uh, this is Operator 60 uh, speaking on the video. So I am not an instructor, I am not, uh, I'm not even a security analyst, I'm not military nor even para paramilitary. I am just on a cosplay right now. And like you, I am a student learning uh, this uh, video video so like I said um, I'm not teaching here I'm not uh, doing any lectures here I am just here like you watching this video trying to learn about uh, piracy and armed robbery on this uh, on on this video uh, which is uh, provided by my uh, company here so I'll probably uh, uh, you know, we're trying to learn here, to be honest. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the average duration of this video, so this is going to be a very long video. It's estimated about one hour. So we're going to start our, uh, our, uh, you know, uh, let's start very early. And uh, at the same time, I would just like to tell that the rules here for every 30 minutes, we're going to take a short break because sometimes lecture videos are very, very tedious and mentally stressing. <laughs> so uh, it wouldn't help. Uh, it would help a lot if we take a video, uh, we take a break every 30 minutes or so just to, you know, refresh our mind, uh, do something. It reduces the stress. So anyway, we're going to start my recording here so uh, let's go okay uh, we're gonna go for first is the principles of vessel defense um, yeah after completing this chapter you will be able to define piracy and armed robbery and list high-risk areas State the risks associated with piracy or armed robbery attacks and explain that risk assessment is a defensive strategy. State parts of a vessel where boarding is easier and explain methods of boarding on the high seas. List international organizations to counter the threat of piracy and armed robbery. Identify reporting schemes to assist in vessel defense. Explain measures to protect personnel if under attack. Discuss the use of armed guards on merchant vessels. Okay, let's uh, click on the next here. Article 101 of the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea states that piracy consists of any illegal acts of violence or detention or any act of depredation committed for private ends by the crew or the passengers of a private ship or a private aircraft and directed on the high seas against another ship or aircraft or against persons or property on board such ship or aircraft against a ship aircraft persons or property in a place outside the jurisdiction of any state it is important to note that an act of piracy takes place on the high seas outside of the jurisdiction of any state hijacking a vessel is often the end result of piracy when the crew and vessel are held and a ransom is demanded for their release. Armed robbery is the taking of money or goods in the possession of another, from their person or immediate presence, by force or intimidation, when the robber is armed with a gun or an offensive weapon. This act committed on the high seas is an act of piracy, but when committed in water under the jurisdiction of a state, is classed as armed robbery. The distinction between the two acts is important to a merchant vessel because the services that render assistance are influenced by the location of the victim vessel. On the high seas, a naval vessel can assist, but it may not be permitted within a state's territorial waters. Here, a victim vessel would be supported by the local services, if they exist. The best form of defense against pirate attack is to avoid known high-risk areas altogether. Passage plans should always be drawn up with this in mind. However, in reality, a vessel sometimes has to sail through or stop in areas where pirates and robbers operate 
so there must be safeguards in place to protect it. The use of pirate motherships has meant that high sea areas, such as the Indian Ocean and waters off West Africa, can no longer be considered threat-free just because they are some distance from a coastline. The International Chamber of Shipping's International Maritime Bureau's 2017 report shows that Southeast Asia, followed by Africa, are the major parts of the world where incidents are reported. Click on the buttons to see more statistics from the 2017 IMB annual report. Okay, so let's click on the one of these seven buttons here. Far East, which includes China, South, Chinese Sea, Vietnam, showed a lot of attacks 2015 that were mainly off Vietnam, but there has been since a steady decline on only four reported in 2017. This is because of, uh, while well, these areas are basically authoritarian governments, so any piracy or acts of criminality will be dealt with swiftly and, bru and brutally. And uh, Singapore actually contributed a lot of these on the pirate suppression thing. And uh, mostly there's no more uh, violent, uh, very, there are very, there's still attacks, but very rare. And they are mostly robbery. They just rob people. Anyway, uh, just only a side comment. So we'll click on number two here. In Southeast Asia, which includes Indonesia, Malacca Straits, Malaysia, Burma, Philippines, and Singapore Straits, has the largest number of reported attacks, which were averaging over 100 per year. I didn't know about that. However, in the last two years, there has been a decline. In 2017, there were 76 reports, with 43 of these coming from Indonesia. Okay. Okay, now uh, let's go on number three. Incident reports in West Africa has started to decline, but has increased again over the last few years. In 2017, there were 46 reports of attacks on the west coast of Africa, with the largest number taking place off Nigeria. However, in this area, it is known that there are more attacks than those reported to IMB. Okay, number 5, Indian Ocean. The Indian subcontinent, which includes Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and India, has a steady number of attacks. In 2017, there were 15 reports, uh, which is uh, pretty small. And we'll go to about uh, number four, which is South America here. Attacks in the Caribbean and South America waters are fairly steady with an average about number 24 in 2017. The largest number came from Venezuela, with Colombia ensuring an increase. Okay, so let's go to the most infamous of all, Somalian coast, which is number six. The east coast of Africa has been steadily declined. In 2011, there were 238 reports. In 2012, there were 80. In 2017, there were only nine reports, thanks to those armed guards that uh, we see fares higher. And hopefully, they are, uh, those armed guards are trigger happy. Now basically, those armed guards are actually PMCs. But anyway, let's go to number 7. During 2017, 3 crew members were killed compared to 8 in 2011. 166 crew members were taken hostage or kidnapped and 6 ships were hijacked compared to 45 ships in 2011. I'm not sure about this one. This is South Atlantic. But anyway, that's, uh, let's go on the next uh, panel here. The IMB's 2017 annual report shows that worldwide reported acts of piracy and armed robbery continue to fall. The 180 reported incidents are the lowest since 1995. Even though this is good news, mariners are still advised to be vigilant in case it is your vessel that is picked on. All right. A summary of the risks associated with piracy and armed robbery include crew mortalities or injuries caused by rocket-propelled grenades, small arms fire, or knife attack, crew being trapped inside a burning vessel, crew suffering mental trauma after an attack or a hijacking, a vessel and crew hijacked and detained until a ransom is paid, having the crew's money and possessions stolen, money stolen from the ship's safe and items of equipment stolen the cargo broached and stolen a vessel loses revenue when detained after hijacking a vessel often needs a lot of work inside the accommodation 
to return it to a fit standard. And after a prolonged hijacking, a vessel usually requires a dry docking to remove weed growth. Okay. Risk assessment is a defensive strategy and should be undertaken well in advance of a vessel arriving into a high risk area. This enables preparations to be made, some of which have to be done in a port environment. IMO Circular 1193 has a self-assessment tool to check a vessel's preparedness, as required by SOLAS Chapter 11 and the International Ship and Port Facility Security Code. As well as using the checklist from IMO Circular 1193, other available methods of risk assessment include using company-specific procedures, using checklists from a country's administration, acting on advice from P&I clubs, and contracting a commercial company to complete the assessment. The best defense against piracy and armed robbery is to deny pirates and robbers access to a vessel. In doing so, crew cannot be taken hostage or the vessel hijacked. For this reason alone, it cannot be stressed enough that it is essential to stop unwanted boarders from gaining access to a vessel. Safeguard vulnerable parts and items of equipment. This includes ensuring the accommodation ladder is in the stowed position. Stowing pilot or portable ladders behind a locked door to stop them being used to assist boarding or escape from a vessel. Closing shell doors that offer an invitation to board when open. Securing horse pipe covers in place to restrict deck access to robbers climbing the anchor cable. Restricting access from permanent overside ladders down to the waterline on specialized vessels. Protecting a vessel with a low freeboard or cutaway access points on the main deck that presents a very easy target for boarders with a ladder. Protecting access stairways to recessed bollards in the hull. The most common method of boarding a vessel on the high seas is from a small boat that maneuvers alongside and uses a hooked ladder or climbing rope to gain access to a vessel's deck. In the Gulf of Aden, these boats are called skiffs and are relatively high speed. They can be recognized because the hooked boarding ladder overhangs one end. There are several international government organizations oh, God, set up to inform mariners of aggressive activity and assist counter piracy and armed robbery. Click on each button for more information. Uh, this is a lot of organizations, the IMB. Um. The International Maritime Bureau was set up in 1981 by the International Chamber of Commerce with the intention of reducing fraud in the shipping world. The initiative came from the IMO in Resolution A504, which asked for organizations and governments to cooperate and exchange information on maritime fraud. In 1992, the IMB created the Piracy Reporting Center based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, with the intention of informing shipping of malicious activity. The center covers the whole world, is non-governmental, and is active 24 hours a day. Okay, so this MSC HOA. Let's click this one. The Maritime Security Center, Horn of Africa, was set up by the European Union in association with the shipping industry. The intention is to have coordination between commercial shipping and international military forces. The center is manned 24 hours a day and focuses on the Gulf of Aden area. It has a useful website for members to gather information. Okay, well that was quick. Uh, right, about the uh, UK MTO. The United Kingdom Maritime Trade Organization, based in Dubai, was set up in 2001 and is the primary point of contact for merchant vessels in the Horn of Africa, Indian Ocean, and Gulf of Aden area. 
They liaise with military forces in the area and work closely with the Maritime Security Center, Horn of Africa, Indian Ocean and Gulf of Aden area. They liaise with military forces in the area and work closely with the Maritime Security Center, Horn of Africa. Okay, let's go for Atlanta. In 2008, as part of the European Common Security and Defense uh, Policy, uh, a naval task force was set up for the Horn of Africa area. The name given to this force is the European Union Naval Force and the operation is called Atlanta. The objective of this task force is to help deter, prevent and repress acts of piracy and armed robbery, protect vessels of the World Food Programme, humanitarian aid and African Union mission on Somalia shipping, protect vulnerable shipping and to contribute to the monitoring of fishing activities off the coast of Somalia. The force has links with NATO, China, India, Japan, Russia, and what used to be US Task Force 150, which is now commanded by one of the supporting nations. Task Force 150 was created to counter terrorism, prevent smuggling, and increase maritime security, but became involved with piracy in the Gulf of Aden. Combined Task Force 151 was set up to specifically target pirate activity. Okay, so how about Marlow? The Maritime Liaison Office yeah, is a United a States Navy mission to exchange information between the commercial maritime community and combined maritime forces in the United States Central Command's area of responsibility, CENTCOM, as illustrated. They have an office in Bahrain and are associated with Task Force 151, which is part of EU NAV4 in the Gulf of Aden. Alright, so how about NATO here? The North Atlantic Treaty Organization shipping website has a lot of information concerning security. Operation Ocean Shield was NATO's contribution to the international efforts to combat piracy off the Horn of Africa. Ocean Shield stopped in 2016, but NATO still has interest in vessel security with Operation Sea Guardian. Their approach to counter piracy is deter, disrupt, protect. We cut up. Oh. In 2006, in Singapore, a center was launched to administer an incentive under a regional cooperation agreement on combating piracy and armed robbery against ships in Asia. Okay. The objective is to share information between regional governments in Asia. All right, next. How about Malka? The Maritime Organization of West and Central Africa is an organization based in Angola with an aim to ensure the sub-region a cost-effective shipping service high on safety and low on pollution. They have a maritime security service called the African Maritime Safety and Security Agency, but not a marine information service. Okay, Whew. this is a very long, tedious task. So we have one, two, three, four, five more to go. Coast Guards and Coastal VTS operations are a source of information concerning piracy and armed robbery incidents in their areas of responsibility. Coast Guards also offer support and assistance to shipping with dedicated vessels and aircraft. Okay, how about the MPHRP? <coughs> The Maritime Piracy Humanitarian Response Program was set up to assist shipping companies and families of piracy victims. They also give advice with a downloadable guide in two parts, one for the company and the other for the individual seafarers and their families. They are a pan-industry alliance of vessel owners, unions, managers, manning agents, insurers, 
and welfare associations. Their website provides a live piracy incident report. Right, we got three more. The International Fusion Center, based in Singapore, was set up by the Singapore Navy. The objective is to act as an information and support center for vessels in the South China Sea, Singapore Strait and Malacca Strait. They work with several nations in the Far East and have close links with RECAP. Whew, okay, two more finally. That was a really tedious thing. Interpol is the world's largest police organization. Their role is to enable police around the world to work together, even within countries not having diplomatic relations. Their aim is to make the world a safer place to live in. Interpol set up a maritime piracy task force with three intentions, namely to improve evidence collection, to facilitate data exchange, and to build regional capabilities. Okay, right, next, last and finally, whew. The 2016 incentive from the NATO Shipping Center saw the launch of the Maritime Domain Awareness for Trade, Gulf of Guinea. The center is manned around the clock with the objective of providing security advice and information sharing with the maritime community. What? That's it? Okay. Well. Okay. Well, finally, we got we got out of. Imagine all of these agencies are responsible on the anti-piracy thing. These are all international organizations, and they are a lot. Anyway, let's click on the next button here for the next panel. States sometimes have voluntary or compulsory coastal vessel traffic services in operation. Reporting to them allows passage of information that may be beneficial to a vessel in areas known for piracy or armed robbery. Vessels on passage in the Gulf of Aden, Arabian Sea and Indian Ocean are asked to report to UK MTO, sending their position, course, speed and ETA to their next port. From 2002, the reporting scheme covers the Red Sea, Indian Ocean north of 5 degrees south, and the Arabian Gulf. Click on the button for more information concerning the report content and when to send it. Okay, let's click on the report button. The UK MTO requests a vessel to report with either oh, an God. initial report before entering the voluntary reporting area, a daily report at 0800 UTC, a final report on exiting the area, and an after-action report following a piracy attack or incident. It is advisable to obtain British Admiralty Chart Q6099 that shows the areas and has other relevant information. The contents of the initial report are outlined in the text. <sighs> Additionally, vessels are requested to report their noon position and speed, actual departure times and estimated arrival times at ports and destination when outward bound from the area. For many years, naval vessels have successfully provided escort duties to merchant vessels. A benefit under Article 107 of the Law of the Sea is that a naval escort vessel is legally allowed to seize a suspected pirate or pirate craft, removing them from further pirate activities. They are also equipped with arms and personnel trained to use them. They have proven to be very useful when used from a distant naval vessel to intercept suspected pirates close to a vessel. Privately contracted vessels also offer armed escorts in the Gulf of Aden and Indian Ocean. These are often ex-naval vessels, but do not belong to any armed service. They escort the contracting merchant vessel during the transit of a high-risk area, 
and are particularly useful for defending slow moving vessels. Okay, uh, next panel, please. Oof. Click on the button to see more information on private security contracts. Oh, Missy, you lead refers to PMC, so uh, let's see about this one. This is Binko on the Montreux uh, document. The Baltic and International Maritime Council, which is an association of ship owners, has guidance regarding private maritime security contractors. They have a standard contract available for use with security guards employed on vessels called GuardCon. So basically these are PMCs. Um, okay, let's go on next here. Armed guards on board bring with them dangerous weapons, so there should be procedures in place to cover the risks associated with them. Only trained personnel should use weapons. It is not recommended that untrained vessels crew ever use them. There should be regular drills so that all personnel are aware of counter piracy actions that would be taken by armed guards. Click on the button to see further guidance. Okay, so there's a further guidance here about armed guards. Let's check it out. Uh, a citadel should be capable of holding all vessels personnel and be equipped with uh, food and water supplies for at least three days. A ventilation system, pretty much obvious. The first aid kit, a communication system with the outside world, more than VHF, more than the VHF radio with at least a three-day power supply. Control of main and auxiliary engines. Pirates should not be able to control the engines. They should not be gained access to begin with. And a CCTV system for vessel surveillance. In uh, of course, uh, this is very self-explanatory. This is to monitor if it's possible that the movement across the uh, vessel and it's a list of contact numbers to allow effective communications basically a helpline or help desk and sanitation facilities basically toilet right uh, let's go when a passage is planned into or through a high-risk area risk should be identified and controlled before the vessel gets anywhere near the area it is not acceptable to face a pirate attack on a poorly prepared vessel. By then, it will be too late, as the likelihood of being boarded is extremely high. If anticipated risk on the planned route cannot be controlled, then the plan should be changed to avoid the high-risk area or other measures implemented. The United Kingdom Hydrographic <coughs> Office has maritime security planning charts available to purchase that are fully supported these are the Q-series of charts that come with the blank copies of the reporting forms. They also have the Admiralty Security Related Information to Mariner's Service, which offers government compiled security information to assist with passage planning. This chapter on the principles of vessel defense is now completed and has covered the following points. Southeast Asia and Africa are the major parts of the world where incidents are reported. Risks associated with these incidents include acts against personnel, vessel and cargo. Use risk assessment as a defensive strategy, identifying parts of a vessel that make boarding easy and plan to defend them. Get to know which international organizations to contact for information including reporting systems in the passage plan areas. A vessel's personnel need protection if under pirate attack. Armed guards can assist with this, but there should be adequate and effective procedures in place. Passage plan to avoid high-risk areas if at all possible. Before we begin the next chapter, let's try these self-assessment questions. Right, uh, this is a self-assessment, but we're not gonna pay attention to it. Pirate can see something act against a ship aircraft property in the place away from Newell. Uh, jurisdiction of the state. Okay, well, who would know? I was right. Okay, which option best identifies where the world's hotspots are for armed robbery as identified by IMO? Uh, basically, uh, yeah. Oh, I was right again. 
Lucky me! Which option best describes the most common method used by pirates to board a vessel that is underway? I think mostly grappling hooks and ropes attached. Oh, okay, using a portable ladder from a small boat. Oh, okay, this was the method in, so uh, in Somalia. Okay, so let's go on the next chapter here, which is managing counter piracy measures. But unfortunately, it's already uh, 30 minutes, so we have to take a break because I myself find it mentally stressing on the first chapter. So we'll take a break and uh, continue on with our uh, lecture video. Hello, good day everyone, and welcome back after that uh, long break that we just took, which took, I guess, several days, because I wasn't feeling well. Uh, anyway, I needed, uh, we needed ourselves to get uh, refreshed because lecture videos are sometimes, or most of the times, very boring and will really, uh, you know, suck the life out of us. But anyway, let's continue on with our uh, next chapter on our... Uh, lecture uh, videos here just to keep in mind i am your classmate i am no instructor when it comes to this just and uh, i am also a seafarer like you or like anybody who's watching this and i am learning myself as well on this uh computer-based trainings so anyway let's proceed so uh, our next chapter here is managing counter piracy measures so uh yeah after completing this chapter you will be able to Identify when to implement anti-piracy measures and the types of anti-piracy measures that can be deployed. Plan work routines for high-risk areas and know the importance of a good lookout. Identify what is meant by a citadel and okay, a safe so area. A citadel here. Identify vessel maneuvers to ward off a pirate attack at sea. Okay, let's proceed with this one. It has already been stated that a vessel should be prepared well in advance of being in a high-risk area. Pirates are less inclined to attack what looks like a well-prepared vessel. Maintenance work should not hinder a vessel from maintaining full speed or from having seawater pumps available. Keeping to essential work only frees up personnel to assist with anti-piracy measures. When transiting a high-risk area, there needs to be an effective lookout at all times and by all means available. Extra lookouts should be posted around the vessel, including the bridge wing, with instructions to be particularly vigilant of activity behind the vessel and in blind sectors. They should be equipped with means of communicating with the bridge and know what to do should they see a suspicious craft approaching. If the craft is suspected to be a pirate craft, Lookouts on deck should immediately no enter the accommodation by the designated access door and secure it. Lookouts should be refreshed regularly with a watch rotation to stop them becoming complacent. Binoculars should be available for bridge lookouts and the vessel's searchlights should always be ready to direct a suspicious craft at night. There should also be a continuous radar watch for unlit vessels in the vicinity. A night vision device is particularly useful to assist with this task. Whilst at anchor or alongside in a high-risk area, there should be regular patrols around a vessel's decks. This includes a foredeck watch for robbers climbing the anchor chain and gaining access to the deck. Closed-circuit television systems are good at maintaining surveillance and are particularly useful on larger vessels. It is necessary to have a person assigned to watch the CCTV in a high-risk area so that any suspicious activity is seen immediately. Having a CCTV system fitted can reduce the need for extra manpower and provide surveillance from a safe place inside a vessel. Cameras should be trained close alongside, over the water, as well as on the vessel's decks. A CCTV system should not replace the visual lookout, which is required by SOLAS when a vessel is underway. Okay, let's proceed now on the next. A vessel security plan should include details of the pirate attack alarms, which should be different to any other alarms. 
Crew members need to understand the meaning of each alarm and subsequent actions they need to take. Muster points need to be in safe areas, away from exposed decks, and that allow the accommodation block to be secured. This ensures that if an attack is about to happen, or is happening, personnel are not mustered on an open deck and exposed to gun or rocket attack. Okay, that's the alarm. It is recommended that the AIS transceiver is left switched on in a high-risk area so that friendly organizations can identify and monitor the vessel. The master has the right to switch off the AIS if they consider this to be the correct action. Although, if attacked by pirates, it is recommended to have the AIS fully operational with minimal data transmitted. The data should be limited to the vessel's identity, position, course, speed and navigational status, and to safety-related information only. Right, so let's proceed to the next panel. Razor wire is very effective at preventing boarding from small boats. It is a physical barrier that should be deployed around a vessel in such a fashion that ladders cannot be leant over or against it to allow access. It should also be rigged securely enough so that it cannot be easily pulled away from the vessel. The recommended type is that supplied with regular barbs and in coils of size 730 by 980 millimeters, so that linked spirals of wire in a concertina style produce an effective barrier. It should be of high tensile material, making it difficult to cut with hand tools. Okay, the parrying conditions ensure that the coils are outward of the vessel structure. There are at least two, preferably three coils on top of each other. The wire is securely rigged on stash Statues are cool feet or something like that. Experience shows that a vessel underway that is fitted with realistic dummies posted as lookouts is less likely to be attacked. It appears that there are a lot of lookouts, giving the impression that the vessel is well prepared to resist an attack. Another type of physical barrier is an electric fence with typically 9,000 volts running through it. It surrounds the whole vessel with the potential to shock anyone touching it. It is recommended that an electric fence system also has warning signs mounted inwards in the local language of the crew and outwards in the language of the local pirates or armed robbers, with symbols warning of the risk of electrical shock. Warning signs themselves are a deterrent, even if there is no electrical fence present. There are loud acoustic systems that can direct a very high intensity sound beam towards an approaching boat. The sound intensity is sufficient to damage eardrums and is a deterrent. However, ear defenders worn by pirates give protection against these devices, making them much less effective. Pirates have also been known to disable them with gunfire, rendering them ineffective. Okay, so I guess uh, let's proceed now to the next panel here. A water barrier deployed around the sides of a vessel is a very effective deterrent as there is the potential to swamp close by pirate skiffs. It is very difficult for a pirate to attempt a boarding through a curtain of fast moving water. The text shows some more recommendations for water dispensing systems on a vessel. Alright, uh, here are some following list offers guidance for water systems. Usually these are powered by uh, seawater. Probably it's directly sometimes connected to the, uh, uh, what do you call this, firefighting systems. I mean the uh, sea, uh, what do you call this, uh, directly connected to the seawater. So uh, steam is Okay, so uh, it's mostly either we just blast them with water, so we use just water cannons, which we uh, typically seafarer use as uh, a firefighting uh, device. But here it can also be used as uh, counter piracy measures. Remember, these methods are only to delay, not only not to stop uh, pirate attacks, and it, of course, uh, well, water cannons are not exactly non-lethal. So anyway, let's uh, proceed ahead on the uh, 
But steam here, I'm not so sure because steam is very hot. But anyway, uh, let's proceed on our next panel here. Vessels have found that firing flares in the direction of pirate skiffs can be a very effective deterrent. Flares are threatening and continue burning when underwater. They also produce light in the area of the pirate skiff, making them more easily seen at night. Flares should be fired from a sheltered area, in case armed pirates return and what they see as weapon fire being directed at them. You know, sometimes I wonder if we could use flares to set those skips, pirate skips on fire, but uh, I'm not sure. I haven't seen any counter anti-piracy measures that they use the flare gun to uh, lit up the uh, uh, pirate skips. But mostly here's the thing, pirate skips are very durable when it comes to, uh, you know, when, when it comes to these types of uh, weapons, if you will use the flare as a weapon, and I don't think this will be effective in uh, at all in uh, stopping those uh, pirates. Still, of course, that's what we, uh, you know, still uh, the most effective way that uh, we could stop piracy uh, on board is that we have armed guard, uh, armed guards, guards or people that have bigger guns than the pirates. So anyway, let's proceed. Accommodation doors should be securely fastened and locked from the inside. A small number of doors can be allocated as general use doors and escape doors. Keys should be located adjacent to the inner part of these doors, allowing crew to exit the accommodation immediately during an emergency on a vessel. Very vulnerable windows can have bars welded across them to restrict access if the window is broken. On deck, all accessible doors to storerooms should be securely closed with some form of locking system applied, preferably from the inside. Padlocks on hasp and clasp locking systems only form temporary deterrents as robbers armed with crowbars or bolt cutters can easily remove even the stoutest padlocks. Stopping robbers from using this equipment to force entry into other spaces is one reason why deck stores should be cleared of heavy tools. Pirates intending to hijack a vessel will board and attempt to enter the wheelhouse using either an inside or outside route. To stop this happening, it is essential to ensure that the bridge cannot be entered from the outside through bridge wing doors. Recommendations include putting physical barriers on bridge wing ladders, such as razor wire, metal gates, fencing or sandbags. As pirates come armed with ladders, ensure that the decks upper from the main deck cannot easily be accessed with a portable ladder. Consider removing fixed access ladders between decks to stop easy access. The engine room can be vulnerable to entry if exposed skylights are left open. As with the bridge, it is essential that no one is able to enter the engine room, capture personnel and force them to slow or stop the main engine. If pirates take hostages in the engine room, it will normally result in the hijacking of the vessel. Okay, next panel. A safe area is a place on board a vessel that provides a muster point for all non-essential personnel if a pirate attack is taking place. It is an area sealed off from the outside, giving protection from small arms fire and rocket-propelled grenades. A citadel is a place of refuge for all personnel when pirates have boarded a vessel. It can resist a determined effort by the pirates to gain entry, normally for a fixed period of time. Several shipping companies have gone to the expense of installing a purpose-built citadel, seeing it as a cheaper option than paying a ransom. Being in a citadel gives more time for armed assistance to arrive. Knowing all crew are contained within a citadel is one of the requirements before a naval force would board a hijacked vessel for military intervention. The MSCHOA has advice on the construction of a citadel. Okay, so there's the Maritime Security Center. 
So Citadel should be capable of holding all vessels personnel and be equipped with full water supplies for at least 3 days, a ventilation system, a first aid kit, a communication system with the outside world, more than VHF radio, at least 3 days power supply, control of remaining uh, main and auxiliary engine pirates should not be able to control the engines, a CCTV system for vessel surveillance, or uh, at least monitor the movement of pirates and a list of contact numbers to allow to effective communications and sanitation facilities now in the maritime like i said we call it citadel but in the land base or if you're in uh, say in land we call it a panic room to be honest okay let's move on ahead okay this Vessels is active maintaining pirates. high speed are less likely to be boarded however the same <coughs> vessel can suffer power loss and the subsequent reduction in speed makes them extremely vulnerable to attack, if not protected. If pirates are attempting to board, do not be persuaded by them to slow the vessel down. Intimidating tactics include instructing a vessel using VHF radio, and maneuvering skiffs ahead of a vessel, so that a collision looks likely. If skiffs are approaching, make their attempted boarding area the weather side by altering course. Start zigzag maneuvers, making course alterations and rudder movements relatively small, so that hull and rudder drag does not slow the vessel down. The objective of the zigzag maneuver is that the vessel picks up some lateral movements, making it more difficult to handle a small boat alongside. This chapter on managing counter piracy measures is now completed and has covered the following points. Anti-piracy measures should be deployed well in advance of being in a high risk area. Okay. Plan work routines for high risk areas and maintain a good lookout. Prepare the vessel using all physical resources available and ensure access is not possible. A safe area is an internal muster point, but a citadel is a secure lockdown place for all personnel. Maintain a high vessel speed without stopping and maneuver the vessel to ward off a pirate attack at sea. Before we begin the next chapter, let's try these four self-assessment questions. Okay, this assessment questions is more like optional. It doesn't matter if we pass or not. Like I said, this is a tool to help us understand and uh, learn something from it not to simulate a test or simulate a classroom and all these tests so it doesn't matter if i get the right answers or we get the right answers or wrong answers as long as we move to the next uh, chapter well we'll choose the long answer here oh okay uh which option correctly completes the following statement uh one of the best defensive strategies to counter pirate attack is to have the crew undertake normal watches, not to panic and secure visual chef, be vigilant and uh, effective lookout. I guess that's correct. So there's a this is another problem. Which of the following statements is the most important when discovered by water spray from a vessel is a good deterrent against attempted boarding from a pirate skiff? Uh, water spray makes it more difficult. Uh, I think it's this one. The second water spray makes it a lot more difficult and can swamp a skiff. Okay, I'm right. Now, swamp means is that uh, we waterlog the skiff. The skiff is basically a speedboat, but in case of the, uh, but compared to a ski, uh, speedboat that is more like a uh, well, uh, well equipped, a skiff is more like uh, say uh, uh, what do you call this? It's more like an improvised version of a boat with uh, with a high, uh, you know, a wooden boat or something like that. So anyway, let's proceed. In an area with a high risk piracy attack, the area should always be switched off. I don't think so. We should keep it false. Okay, I'm right. Well, I guess it's this is something about probably it's about identification, especially when law enforcement or uh, you know anti piracy squad arrives, so they could identify uh, the ship and locate it. I guess I, I'm not sure. Sure, of course. I'm like I said, I'm a fellow student like you, and we're just you know taking this uh lecture video okay so we we'll go for the next uh, chapter um so that was a quick 18 minutes so we're gonna get information from bmp5 basically this is the manual on uh anti-piracy i think uh, released by the imo so uh let's 
uh, proceeded checking this out. After completing this chapter, you will be able to state the purpose of publication BMP5, identify the geographical areas covered by BMP5, identify the Gulf of Aden Transit Corridor, list vessel and company recommendations under BMP5. Oh yeah, just an addition for this so-called BMP. BMP stands for Best Management Practices. Now I don't know why it's called 5, maybe it's edition number 5 or something like that. But anyway, that's an additional information. The purpose of the publication Best Management Practice version 5 is to assist shipping companies and mariners prepare their vessel for passage through the high-risk areas of the Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, Indian Ocean and Arabian Sea. It is there to assist vessels avoid, deter and delay pirate attacks. Click on each button for a list of contents and the organizations that support BMP5. Click on each button for a list of contents. Okay, let's go for BMP5 content number one. So these are fundamental requirements of BMP. It's kind of a lot. It's about eight sections with annex. Uh, you can just simply pause the video and take a look at this. Uh, personally, I uh, I'm don't really have in the mood to uh, enumerate all of this one by one. We're just going to give a brief uh, summary of what is the VIP content number one. So anyway, let's go to content number two. On several of the world's major organizations representing shipping companies, cargo owners, and crew interests support the principles and practice contained in BMP5 organization under SIGTO, Intertanko, Intercargo, OCIMF, and the Mission to Seafarers, to name a few. Yeah, I think we got that a lot, but uh, that's very quick. Okay, let's proceed to the next panel. The publication is intended for use in the high-risk areas that are defined as areas where pirate attacks have recently taken place or suspicious craft have been seen. In 2015, the area was reduced in size and is now bounded by Suez and the Straits of Hormuz to the north and the latitude of 5 degrees south and longitude 65 degrees east. Mariners should be vigilant in other areas because new attacks could always happen outside a designated high-risk area. There are various fundamental principles listed in BMP-5. The first principle is to understand the threat and then undertake risk assessments. This is followed by implementing ship protection measures and then registering with the Maritime Security Center, Horn of Africa. Just before entering the voluntary reporting area, send an initial report to the UK Maritime Trade Organization. A major principle is to cooperate with shipping and military forces whilst in the high-risk area. Okay. As the vessel transits, oh, daily reports are required. When leaving the high-risk area, a final report should be submitted. Annexes D and E contain all the forms required. Okay, so I guess that's about it. Uh, let's move to the next panel here. In the Gulf of Aden and Southern Red Sea, there is a recommended route. Part of this route in the Gulf of Aden is called the International Recommended Transit Corridor, IRTC for short. An extension to the IRTC connects to the Bab el Mandeb and Hanish Islands recommended route. Along these security corridors, there is a large naval presence and greater surveillance. Vessels can form a group to transit, but in any case, should always follow the transit corridor. It is not recommended that a vessel waits for others to transit, as it becomes more vulnerable to pirate attack if stopped. A vessel in a transit corridor could still be attacked, and should take all precautions to prevent this. Okay, so the uh, the maritime security transit corridor goes all the way to the Gulf of Aden and down to the Red Sea. So it ends probably somewhere here in this island. I'm not familiar with the map, but uh, it's somewhere in the Eritrea, Eritrea, uh, uh, you know, maritime uh, area. Anyway, it just covers the whole uh, coastline of Somalia here. 
So let's proceed on our next uh, panel here. BMP-5 highlights that it is not just the responsibility of a vessel alone to safeguard itself against piracy, but also the company owning or managing the vessel. Recommendations for the company include registering with MSCHOA to get access to information on their website, obtaining information from MSCHOA and NATO to assist the complete planning and execution of a passage plan, review the vessel security assessment and security plan, discuss with the master and security officer the implementation of the vessel security plan, to make sure it is in place at the correct time. Ensure the vessel's master is aware of the current threat in their location and ahead of them. Work with the master to ensure vessel protection measures have been arranged and are in place before entering high-risk areas. Conduct crew training and drills. Be available to offer the master advice during the transit of high-risk areas. Make sure the vessel's movement registration form has been submitted to MSCHOA. Section 4 of BMP-5 lays down the areas of planning needed to be undertaken by a vessel's master. Planning guidance is contained in earlier sections of this module and is concerned with preparing a vessel, monitoring the situation and communicating with relevant organizations. Okay, let's proceed. This chapter on BMP-5 is now completed and has covered the following points. Guidance contained in BMP-5 should be followed by a vessel transiting the high-risk areas. High-risk areas are classed as the Gulf of Aden, Arabian Sea and Indian Ocean. The Maritime Security Transit Corridor is a patrolled corridor in the Gulf of Aden up into the Red Sea recommended to be used when transiting the area. There are recommendations for both a vessel's crew and a company owning or managing a vessel under BMP-5. Before we begin the next chapter, let's try these four self-assessment questions. Okay, another boring self-assessment questions. Okay, let's try to uh, answer this as the best as we could. This section allows you to practice and test your knowledge, duh. No score will be recovered as the exercise as many times as you wish. Yeah, whatever. This is not a classroom, so I don't really give a crap about it if we get the right or wrong answer. So anyway, so select the option that best describes the maritime security transit corridor established by MSCHOA. Whew, that was a mouthful. The system great covers on the... Uh, probably it's a system of uh, escort convoys. Oh, it's recommended the shipping route in the Gulf Aden. Okay. So, which of the options is correct in relation to the following statements? Under BMP-5, the vessel is solely responsible for preparing the vessel to counter piracy. Answers. Uh, I think we go with the last one. Let's check this one. This statement is not correct as the shipping company also has responsibilities. Yep, everybody is involved in counter piracy measures. Not only the crew, because they're the ones being attacked inside the ship anyway. Also, the shipping company, because it's their ship. And it's the one that's being hijacked. So, uh, select the option that correctly completes the following statement. The main purpose of publication BMP-5 is to assist mariners to how I think... Uh, mariners to prepare their vessel for being... Uh, I think we should go with this one, Gulf of Aden. Mariners to prepare their vessel for for being in the Gulf of Aden. Right? So we got that one, uh, we bagged that one correct. BMP-5 is supported by several interested organizations to counter piracy in the Gulf of Aden, Indian Ocean and Arabian Sea. Well, I think that is true, obviously. Yeah, well, it's a no-brainer. Okay, let's return to the main chapter. So we've already go with the managing counter piracy measures. Information from BMP-5. Let's go for counter piracy measures. Other areas. This is not uh, included on the. Uh, this does not refer to the Gulf of Aden, but there are other areas in that there are under 
uh, areas that have some pirate uh, pirate activity. Of course, it's Southeast Asia, South America. Anyway, let's check. After completing this chapter, you will be able to state the function of the International Maritime Bureau Piracy Reporting Center and demonstrate knowledge of its area of influence. State the function of the RECAP organization and demonstrate knowledge of its area of influence. Identify the need to be vigilant and take precautions in other high-risk areas outside those covered by BMP-5 guidance. Okay, let's uh, proceed now to the next panel here. The IMB Piracy Reporting Center is involved in information sharing with industry, law enforcement agencies, governments and flag states in an attempt to reduce and ultimately eradicate crime. The PRC enables the shipping industry to gain knowledge of risk areas. Their services are free and are available 24 hours a day. The PRC website offers advice to masters, a live piracy map and live piracy reports. Quarterly and annual piracy so and armed robbery reports are also available. And there is a link for masters to report attack incidents. The main functions of the IMB PRC are twofold. Firstly, to be a single point of contact for a vessel master who is on a vessel under attack by pirates or armed robbers anywhere in the world. The information received from the master requesting assistance is immediately relayed to the local law enforcement agencies. Secondly, to ensure that the information received from the vessel master is immediately broadcast to all vessels in the region, therefore highlighting the threat to any other vessel en route into the high-risk area. Okay, so uh, we've already finished this panel and we're going to take a short break because uh, it's already 30 minutes so we don't want to stress ourselves out, out mentally. So uh, let's take a break here for about a uh, few minutes. Hello everyone and welcome back after that uh, refreshing break that we just took in. Uh, of course, uh, we'll just keep it in mind that we're going to take ev uh, a break every 30 minutes or so just to refresh ourselves because, uh, of course, this is very boring lectures, <laughs> but we had to take it because uh, for information and academic reasons. Anyway, let's proceed now on our next panel here. The full title of the RECAP organization, which was set up by several governments, is the Regional Cooperation Agreement on Combating Piracy and Armed Robbery Against Ships in Asia. RECAP established the Information Sharing Center to pass information between contracting parties on incidents of piracy and armed robbery, and also to have cooperation agreements between countries. The main roles of the Information Sharing Center are two, serve as a platform for communications and information exchange among participating governments to improve incident response by member countries to analyze piracy and armed robbery incidents and to provide accurate statistics to allow better understanding of the situation in asia and to facilitate capacity building efforts that help improve the capability of member countries in combating piracy and armed robbery in the region and to cooperate with organizations and like-minded parties on joint exercises, information sharing, capacity building program, or other forms of cooperation. Okay, so let's move on to the next panel. Click on the button to see some more information from Circular 1334. Okay, so let's click on the button to see more of this information. Piracy and armed robbery against ships. The text okay. shows some of the points listed in IMO Circular 1334. Hmm. Flag states are required to reinforce their shipping responsibilities to take necessary protection measures for vessels, cargo, and crew. The robber's objectives is theft of cargo, a vessel, and possession. 
Remove temptation by reducing the amount of cash held on board and be discreet with communications at sea and in port. Consider whether the AIS system should be active. Consider engaging security staff and or surveillance equipment because of small crew numbers. Following industry recommendations and procedures in safety management system or the ship security plan. Route the vessel away from and avoid anchoring in high risk areas, basically no anchoring on pirate infested areas. And have drills for pirate attack and be vigilant at all times, which of course includes a lookout. And there are sections on defensive tactics and attack scenarios. Okay, so let's proceed next panel. As with piracy, <coughs> it is difficult to get information on acts of armed robbery in certain areas outside the Indian Ocean and Gulf of Aden. There are the same international centers to call upon, but often local knowledge can be provided by a port's VTS, coast guards, or a local pilot on a vessel. Continuous risk assessment by all crew members should be actively encouraged when a vessel is within port limits, as this is often a time when theft occurs. Locally employed watchmen are often a source of information for robbers. They should therefore not be trusted with keys or valuable information relating to security. In port, the side of a vessel against the key is often less vulnerable than the water side, as there is often less security provided on the water side compared to the key side. Okay, next panel. In ports with recorded incidents of robbery or piracy, avoid anchoring if at all possible. A virtual notice of readiness can often be posted some distance from the port. A vessel can then make its final approach at full speed through pirate-infested waters to time its arrival when the berth is available. Click on the button for more information on safeguarding a vessel that has to anchor off a high-risk port. Okay, let's click the safeguards. The text shows some of the typical safeguards that can be taken on a vessel at anchor. Okay, ensure the vessel and surrounding water is well lit so that approaching boats are easily seen. Have such flight available to use. Maintain a 24-hour deck watch with surveillance taking place from all parts of the vessel. Hoist accommodation ladders and stop rope ladders. Have uh, water sprays ready to activate at all the time. Um, if there is a possibility of armed robbers or pirates, ensure that all personnel are in safe positions where they can be neither fired or be taken hostage. And uh, of course, in a very high risk areas, have the usual physical barriers rigged on the ship that includes razor wires that we have uh, encountered a few minutes ago. And uh, we're also going to check with VTS for information on the legitimacy of visiting craft and liaise with port services, other vessels, and company security officer for information and find out all the ways to... Okay, let's uh, proceed by next on the next panel. In coastal waters close to ports, pirates and robbers often conceal themselves within fishing fleets to pounce on an unsuspecting passing vessel. Coastal areas such as the Malacca or Singapore Straits and in Indonesia have many reported cases of robbery happening close to land, in VTS surveillance areas and in areas surrounded by other vessels. Robbers act quickly and leave a vessel before naval support arrives. Okay, next. This chapter on other parts of the world is completed and has covered the following points. There are some very useful organizations, such as IMB, NATO, and RECAP, offering information. Do not forget local knowledge is available from VTS, Coast Guards, and Port Services. Do not anchor a vessel in a high-risk area unless absolutely essential to do so. If at anchor or alongside in a port, always be vigilant to safeguard against robbery. In high-risk coastal waters, be vigilant and maintain a lookout for suspicious craft approaching. Before we begin the next chapter, let's try these four self-assessment questions. Okay, let's proceed next. Alright, another boring assessment. 
Okay, the primary aim of International Maritime Bureau Piracy Reporting Center is to be a worldwide contact list. Uh, I think we'll go with this one. Okay, well, what do you know? It was correct. Okay, uh, which option is the most accurate in relation to the following statement? IMO are only interested in pirate... The statement is incorrect, gives any part of the world. Yeah, we'll just go with the first one. So we got that right. Uh, which two options are the most accurate in relation to the following statement? A vessel at anchor off a port is fairly safe from local robbers. Uh, yeah, it's mostly correct, I guess. Oh, okay, the statement is incorrect as anchored vessels is very vulnerable and the statement is incorrect. Yeah, okay, whatever. <clears throat> Okay, so this is one the last one. Which option best describes the action to take with the anchor off a port where it is known that robbers have taken place on the vessel? Keep a fire hose ready and spray. Uh, I think we're going to this one. Okay, maintain full physical defense. Right. Um, so we got here our last chapter of this uh, lecture video. We're not going to go through the assessment basically a waste of time so we're, it's basically a definition of a uh, company security officer after completing this chapter you will be able to okay. state the responsibilities of a company security officer state the importance of gathering information <sighs> from organizations right. when appraising state how to ensure that all crew members are prepared for possible attacks List the possible risks that the master needs to be aware of. Okay, well that was quick. Click on the button to see information contained in MSC 1390. Right, uh, let's just see MSC 1390. The text shows some of the responsibilities listed in IMO Circular 1390. Yeah, okay. Now just keep in mind that this is mostly just management. It doesn't tell on the point of view of an ordinary crew member or an ordinary crew on the vessel. This is mostly, uh, let's just say, uh, bureaucratic pencil pushing thing. Unfortunately, pirates and armed robbers do not publicize their activities meaning that risk appraisals are often based on very little information. World organizations and reporting centers offer a system of gathering and feeding information to interested parties that helps appraisal. To assist this process, vessel masters are encouraged to supply details of any relevant or suspicious happenings, no matter how trivial they seem. Information can also be obtained from passing vessels if they have recent experience in a high-risk area. In coastal areas, a rescue coordination center often has useful information. Interpol has set up a maritime piracy task force with the intention of improving the evidence gathering to counter piracy, while understanding that the maritime environment presents some unique difficulties when gathering information. They have a database and attempt to target pirate leaders and identify their assets. They also provide local police training to counter piracy from inside a country. Okay, right. In high-risk areas, rescue coordination centers often have relevant information, so it is essential to maintain a listening watch and communicate with them. Ask for help if needed and contribute to the information pool even if there have been no events in a high-risk area, as a pattern of pirate activity is developed from vessel reports. The RCC has a direct line to naval authorities, who usually have large amounts of intelligence information to pass on. Oh. The company security officer has the responsibility to ensure that drills and training have taken place. It is in the interest of all those on board a vessel to ensure that they are prepared for any event, including attempted boarding for hijack or robbery. Before arriving in the high-risk area, all personnel on a vessel should be aware of the audible signals for indicating that a pirate attack is happening. An attack has stopped 
or to give instruction to gather in the citadel. They should be aware of what actions to take when each signal is sounded, and also what to do if the vessel has a separate emergency during a pirate attack. Right. The ship's security alert system is a silent method of communicating with a mission control center or a designated person ashore who may be the company security officer. The SSAS should not be confused with or used as a SOLAS distress signal. The objective when used during a piracy incident is to send a covert signal that will not irritate pirates on the vessel. Upon receiving an SSAS message, the relevant naval assistance can be dispatched to assist a vessel. IMO circulars 1072 and 1073 have information on the use of the SSAS, including that the GMDSS equipment will not be used to respond to a covert message in case ah, the pirates become be alarmed, bad. potentially making the situation worse. It is the responsibility of the company security officer to arrange a procedure to be followed upon receiving an SSAS message. Okay, let's proceed to the next panel here. This is very boring because this is more like bureaucratic stuff, not the stuff that uh, actually uh, tells on how to handle if there are pirates on board. A PAN message should be sent on all communication systems. If pirate craft are positively identified and an attack looks likely. If an attack subsequently takes place, send out a mayday call on VHF channels 16 and 8, both of which are monitored by naval vessels, and a distress message via the digital selective calling system. By using the GMDSS equipment, other vessels and shore authorities are notified. This will include the pirate mothership and possibly pirate skiffs. If pirates are on a vessel, avoid using GMDSS communication equipment as this could provoke them. Okay, let's pass on the next panel here. Oof. Effective risk assessment means being aware of the immediate situation a vessel is in and of possible future events happening. It is vitally important for the company security officer based ashore to gather as much advanced information as possible for areas ahead of a vessel to assess any developing risk. A CSO can sometimes access information not available at sea. It is essential that any relevant information is immediately passed on to ensure a vessel's readiness. Okay, fine, fine. This chapter on the role of the company security officer is completed and has covered the following points relating to their responsibilities. They are required to liaise with personnel on a vessel before and during its transit of a high-risk area. They should ensure that crew members and supernumeraries are prepared for the transit of a high-risk area. Drills should be carried out before and during transit of high-risk areas. Setting up and maintaining effective communications with a vessel is very important. A vessel's master should know the types of message to send and which equipment to use. Before you begin the module assessment, let's first try these four okay, self-assessment questions. Oh, okay, I'm glad it's over. Next. Okay, so this is the final assessment, but uh, we're not going to pay attention with this one. Uh, why is it going to... I don't know. Learning from my insurance company. I'm sure we'll tell you that those at sea. Okay, it's crashed on the vessel under the sea. Uh, identifiable risk. Okay, which describes messaging using SIM 3 GMDSS equipment to another pirate attack. I think we should send an alarm on the ship security alert system. Basically, it's an alarm that informs the office that we are under attack by pirates. Oh, okay, send out a main day, okay. DSC, prepare the vessel, uh, I don't know. Uh, 
Okay, so I guess that it finishes our uh, lecture video on about piracy and armed robbery. So uh, I do apologize if there are some instances that our lecture video was a bit boring. But uh, you know these things, uh, usually uh, these things are more like uh, simulate a classroom, which adds more frustration on my, uh, on my part if I'm the one taking this as well. So uh, before we end this uh, video, uh, if it's okay with you, you can hit on the like and subscribe video. It's not that much, but it will really help me out in the YouTube algorithm. So again, this is Operator 60. Have a great day, everyone, and see you on our next uh, lecture video sessions. Bye-bye for now. Okay, uh, yeah, just give me a moment here.